Warlords of the Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei. This video was made possible by our sponsor, Creative Assembly, and their new game, Total War Three Kingdoms. As the Han Empire collapsed in the 2nd century, many warlords would arise to fight amidst its ruins. This cast of characters vying for the throne had a wide range of complex motivations, but thanks to centuries of storytelling, they would each be distilled down to a digestible essence of human nature. Some were cruel and tyrannical, some brave and arrogant, and others cold and calculating. In our story today, we will be covering the tale of Liu Bei, whom legends would remember as the upright and benevolent hero of the people. Liu Bei was born in 161 in the Zhuo Commandery of northeastern China. His family had once been of some repute and could supposedly trace their lineage back to Emperor Jing, the sixth ruler of the Western Han Dynasty. However, some three centuries later, the family had fallen on hard times, having lost their royal titles and wealth. Liu Bei's father was a provincial official, but died early on, leaving his wife and young son in a state of poverty. To make ends meet, they wove straw sandals and mats to sell in their small village. This humble upbringing would prove quite formative for the future leader who would be hailed as a hero of the common people, thanks to his modesty, empathy, and benevolence. Luckily, Liu Bei was rescued from a life of total destitution and obscurity by an uncle who was able to provide financial support. This boon, along with some lingering familial connections, allowed the youth to launch his career. At the age of 15, Liu Bei left his home behind to take up studies under a prominent court official. Through this apprenticeship, he learned much about politics and was able to forge lasting connections that would help him throughout his life. In 184, Liu Bei's relatively peaceful life was upended by the outbreak of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, this uprising against the Han Empire saw many peasant armies sweep across the land with instability and violence following in their wake. Liu Bei was just in his 20s at the time, but felt a deep calling to protect his home and its people. According to legend, Liu Bei would take up arms with two other men, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, the three would become inseparable and swore an oath to join in brotherhood to protect the realm, vowing to die on the same day. Liu Bei and his oath brothers then led a militia to join local efforts against the rebellion. Here, small war bands clashed in minor skirmishes or coalesced into larger armies to fight more dramatic battles. In these efforts, Liu Bei's band would prove quite effective the upstart warlord was rewarded for his service with a low-level government post overseeing a small town. But after a combative interaction with an imperial inspector, he was forced to abandon the position. Shortly thereafter though, Liu Bei once again led militia forces into battle against new rebel threats, and these actions earned him another government post. While the rebellion raged on, things back in the Han capital had quickly deteriorated. The emperor died, leaving his young heirs and the throne vulnerable to the influences of nefarious forces. Ultimately, the power vacuum was filled by Dong Zhuo, an ambitious warlord from the northwestern provinces who swept in with his army. In response, warlords from across the empire rose up to oppose this usurper, the young Liu Bei and his oath brothers set off to join the coalition. According to legend, the three would make quite the name for themselves battling in heroic duels before the armies. Historically, however, their contributions were of relatively little note at this time. When the coalition against Dong Zhuo failed to end the tyrant's reign, it fizzled out due to infighting. The once unified lands of the Han now fractured as the many warlords fought to claim their piece of the crumbling empire. 
For the next decade, Liu Bei would play the role of a minor warlord, sometimes managing to gain control of as much as a province, but never being able to hold on to power for long as he found himself constantly bullied about by larger powers. These wandering years would begin with his service under an old friend to the north, the general Gongsun Zan, whom he served over the course of several campaigns. Next, Liu Bei came to the defense of Tao Qian when the warlord Cao Cao made a move on the Xu province in 193. When the invasion faltered, a dying Tao Qian would gift the province to Liu Bei, trusting in his ability to protect the people. Meanwhile, Cao Cao had managed to rebuff an invasion by Lü Bu into his own province of Yan. The defeated warlord fled into the arms of Liu Bei. However, Lü Bu would ultimately betray his host and usurp control of the province. To make matters worse, Liu Bei would be dealt a defeat by Yuan Shao. These dual blows forced Liu Bei to seek shelter with Cao Cao. Operating under this new master, Liu Bei would assist in the campaigns against his former opponents, the generals Lü Bu and Yuan Shao. By the year 199, both would be dead. This put Cao Cao in an extremely powerful position. Many, including the emperor, feared his ambition, and a conspiracy was formed to assassinate Cao Cao. Liu Bei would join the conspirators. However, in 200, the plot would be discovered. Most of the other conspirators were executed, while Liu Bei was once again forced to flee. Liu Bei would make his way south to Jing province, where he would be given command of an outpost by his relative Liu Biao. The region had largely avoided the revolts and battles of the northeast, and was a haven for many war refugees thanks to its prosperity. In these more peaceful lands, the 42-year-old Liu Bei would feel lost. Falling into a deep melancholy, he admitted, quote, The days and months pass like a stream, and old age will come, but I have achieved nothing. However, fortunes soon changed. Over the next decade, Liu Bei would experience a late-blooming career that would catapult him to greatness. This would all begin in 207, when he was introduced to the talented Zhuge Liang, who became his chief military strategist and proposed an ambitious plan. The long-term strategy would be to secure a base in the south by taking Jing and Yi provinces, then forming a coalition with the forces to the east in order to oppose the powerful Cao Cao to the north. Yet, as this planning took place, Liu Bei would once again find himself forced to react to the moves of the others. In 208, Cao Cao had consolidated his northern possessions and was now launching a campaign into the south. Just at this moment, Liu Biao died unexpectedly of illness, and his son yielded the Jing province to the invader without bloodshed. Liu Bei fled with a great refugee caravan of civilians and soldiers, seeking safety in the territories of Wu, controlled by the Sun family. Cao Cao's forces were hot on their tail. According to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei was urged by his advisors to abandon the slow-moving group and flee alone, but he refused, saying, quote, To accomplish a grand enterprise, you must make the people your foundation. Right now, the people have pledged themselves to me, so how can I bear to abandon them? Ultimately, however, Cao Cao's men did catch up. Facing certain capture, Liu Bei was forced to make an escape. Thanks to his rear guard and oath brothers, he would evade Cao Cao and make it to the lands of Sun Quan. Here, he took residence in a garrison at Fancheng, where he was joined by a growing number of levies. Liu Bei then sent his advisor Zhuge Liang to form an alliance with Sun Quan. Together, they would take on Cao Cao. The Southern Coalition famously engaged the Northern Army at the Battle of Red Cliff. Though badly outnumbered, the forces of Liu Bei and Sun Quan proved victorious following a surprise attack by fireboats across the river, 
and a devastatingly effective follow-up strike that sent the forces of Cao Cao into a bloody retreat. In the aftermath, southern armies would conduct operations against the remaining northern troops along the Yangzi River. In this way, Liu Bei managed to gain control of four commanderies, Wuling, Changsha, Lingling, and Guiyang, and even retook the strategic Jing province. By now, Liu Bei had become quite powerful. Sun Quan continued to see him as a necessary ally against Cao Cao, and even married his sister to Liu Bei. Shortly after establishing himself in Jing province, Liu Bei returned to the strategy originally proposed by Zhuge Liang, and his eyes turned to the neighboring lands. When the ruler of the Yi province invited Liu Bei to station troops in his territory to deter a possible invasion by Cao Cao, Liu Bei simply took the opportunity to invade the territory himself. Fighting went on for several years, but by 214, Liu Bei was in control of Yi province. Next, he launched an attack into the strategic regions of Hanzhong, finally taking it from Cao Cao in 219. This would mark the peak of his territorial control. Now, just over a decade after despairing of his ignominious fate, Liu Bei declared himself the king of Hanzhong, setting himself up as an equal rival to Cao Cao, who by this point had been named the king of Wei. Sun Quan regarded these aggressive actions with growing concern. His relationship with Liu Bei was already fraying due to territorial disputes and long-simmering tensions. These affairs would reach a breaking point when Cao Cao opportunistically entered into a secret alliance with Sun Quan, urging him to deal a blow to Liu Bei in exchange for conferring legitimacy to Sun Quan's rule. An attack was launched on Jing province in 219. At the time, Guan Yu, one of Liu Bei's oath-sworn brothers, had been left in control of the territory and was waging war on Cao Cao's forces at Fancheng. Sun Quan capitalized on this by launching a rapid, surprise assault to Guan Yu's rear. Sun Quan did so by stealthily taking out guard posts and watch positions before swooping in suddenly to capture the civilian population, and specifically the families of Guan Yu's soldiers. This brilliant move cut off Guan Yu's retreat and shattered the fighting spirit of his army, which began to desert or surrender in mass. Guan Yu attempted to flee, but was captured in an ambush and executed. Thus, Liu Bei lost both his closest friend and Jing province. He was furious and made ready for a war of vengeance against Sun Quan. Meanwhile, in 220, Cao Cao died and was succeeded by his son Cao Pi. This new ruler of the north was encouraged by the brewing war between his two greatest southern rivals and now formally declared an end to the Han dynasty, proclaiming himself the Emperor of Wei. In response, Liu Bei declared himself the Emperor of Shu and the true continuation of the Han. Cao Pi launched several attacks against Shu lands as Liu Bei remained focused on his war with Sun Quan. In 222, Liu Bei personally led his armies to retake Jing province and avenge Guan Yu. The campaign found initial success in pushing back the enemy, but would meet disaster in the summer of 223 when Liu Bei's army was routed by a surprise fire attack on their camp. The defeat crippled Shu's military strength, and Liu Bei was forced to retreat to Bai Di Cheng. A broken man, he fell into rapid decline and died shortly thereafter. On his deathbed, Liu Bei appointed his longtime advisor, Zhuge Liang, as regent to look over his young heir, Liu Shan. The new emperor had his father brought back to Chengdu and entombed. In the years that follow, strength would once again return to Shu. Peace was declared with Sun Quan, and their former alliance restored as a counterbalance to the Northern Wei. Thus, the partition of the Three Kingdoms was in place. 
history would treat Liu Bei kindly. This was especially true in the oral traditions of the common folk who lionized him as a champion of their cause. Such framing of his character would be immortalized in the famous novel The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, written about a thousand years later. In it, Liu Bei was glorified as the hero of the book, an embodiment of Confucian virtue and a sage, compassionate lord who loved the people and valued the advice of wise men. In short, he came to represent the good of righteous politics in opposition to the Machiavellian scheming of the villain Cao Cao. We should, however, be careful with such black and white characterizations. After all, while Liu Bei's career was certainly worthy of admiration, at the end of the day, it was achieved through much of the same ugly process employed by his rival warlords. If you would like to learn more about this period of ancient China, you can do so by checking out Total War Three Kingdoms, Relive the past in this turn-based campaign of empire building and conquest with stunning real-time battles fought for control of the realm. Choose from a cast of 12 legendary warlords, recruit heroic characters to aid your cause, and dominate your enemies on military, technological, political, and economic fronts. Will you build powerful friendships, form brotherly alliances, and earn the respect of your many foes? Or would you rather commit acts of treachery, inflict heart-wrenching betrayals, and become a master of grand political intrigue? Your legend is yet to be written, but one thing is certain. Glorious conquest awaits. A huge thanks is owed to our supporters on Patreon and the many talented researchers, writers, and artists who made this video possible please consider contributing to fund future content. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.